Hi, and welcome to the GBSU Art Gallery. I'm Amanda Rainey, the User Experience and Learning Manager here at the gallery. This is our fifth Live from the Gallery session. If you'd like to watch or re-watch any of the previous sessions, you can do so on our IGTV channel or our YouTube channel. And I'll post this video to YouTube with links to the, the content related to what I'm going to talk about here today. Right now, we're standing in the Art Gallery in the Haas Center for Performing Arts, but the GDSU Art Collection can be found all over campus and online. In addition to our permanent collection online, which includes more than 12,000 works of art, you can find additional learning resources related to our exhibitions. For this exhibition, Celebrate People's History, for example, we've actually created a reading list in collaboration with the GDSU libraries of books and articles related to the themes addressed by the artworks in this exhibition, some hard copies, some digital, all of which you can find through the GBSU Libraries database. So be sure to check out that reading list on gbsu.edu slash art gallery. All right, let's get started. Today I want to talk about this poster and the woman it depicts, Karita Kent. To quote the poster, Karita Kent was a radical educator silkscreen printing pop artist, an activist agitator whose pedagogical and political exuberance extended to civil, civil rights, war resistance, feminist critique, and a joyful participatory body politic. And today I want to tell you about her life, her work, and her legacy on both art and activism. But before we get to that, I want to mention the two artists that created this poster. Shannon Gerard and Mary Tremont. Shannon and Mary are artists and activists in their own right, and judging on their Instagram posts, are good friends. I'll include links to their websites and our stories and our YouTube channel later, so be sure to check out their bodies of work. Back to Karita. A little bio for you first. Karita was born in 1918 in Fort Dodge, Iowa, as Frances Elizabeth Kent. When she was very young, her family moved to Hollywood, California, and her family was very devoutly Catholic and also working poor. So after graduation of high school, she entered the Order of the Immaculate Heart of Mary and took the name Sister Mary Carita. She attended Immaculate Heart College and graduated in 1941. She then taught primary school in British Columbia for a little while, and in 1947, she was called back to IHC to join the faculty of the art department. She began graduate school at the University of Southern California that same year, and then graduated with her MFA in 1951. Her early artistic influences included abstract expressionist art and folk art, but then her tastes evolved to favor pop art and imagery from advertisements and packaging. Karita taught at IHC for 21 years, and it was a relatively liberal place for a Catholic institution. It was really known for nourish nourishing creativity. She became the face and standard bearer of the art department there, creating an avant-garde community that attracted artists and intellectuals like Alfred Hitchcock, John Cage, Saul Bass, Buckminster Fuller, and Charles and Ray Eames. The artist Ben Shang called her the joyous revolutionary. She famously developed 10 art department rules for her students, the first of which is find a place you trust and try trusting it for a while. Other rules included pull everything out of your teacher, pull everything out of your fellow students, consider everything an experiment. The only rule is work. If you work, it'll lead to something. But also rules like be happy when you can manage it, enjoy yourself, it's lighter than you think. So as you might imagine, she expected her students to work hard, but also to give themselves grace. That dichotomy of ideas is a thread that we can trace through her entire career. She wanted more than anything to uplift everyday images and words and to create beauty from her surroundings. And in her most active decade, the 1960s, those surroundings were pretty tumultuous. Today, she's most well known for her work from that decade. She used her art to protest and comment on issues like the Vietnam War, poverty, racial injustice and gender inequality, while generally challenging the rigid conservatism of the day, something she was especially aware of as a Catholic nun. Her work from this time is super colorful.
colorful with distinct references to pop culture, advertisements and comic packaging labels like Wonder Bread, combined with text pulled from pop songs and advertising slogans right alongside religious texts. As you might imagine, this bold aesthetic didn't go over well with some members of the Catholic Church, especially the leadership of the Los Angeles Archdiocese, Cardinal James Francis McIntyre, who was often at odds with the Immaculate Heart Sisterhood for their liberal leanings. He actually declared Carita's works to be sacrilegious and banned many of them from being shown publicly. Specifically, these two, Mary Does Laugh and the Juiciest Tomato of All. Hopefully you're seeing those on your screen right now. Both from 1964. In Mary Does Laugh, Carita Hand wrote the declaration, Mary Does Laugh, and she sings and runs and wears bright orange. Today, she'd probably do her shopping at the Market Basket. The Market Basket was the grocery store next to IHC. In the juiciest tomato of all, Carita included the text, Mary Mother is the juiciest tomato of all. Both statements were actually paraphrased from observations made by friends and former students. And as writer Theo Inglis points out in his 2019 article for AIGA, these statements were actually intended to be an exuberant affirmation of Mary's glory, perfection, beauty, and ability to give spiritual nourishment. I'll drop that article, a link to that article, when we post this video later. It's really great. In 1968, after serving four years as chair of the art department at IHC, while balancing a grueling schedule of speaking engagements and private commissions, Carita took a sabbatical. She was exhausted and discovered after just three months on sabbatical that she needed a more permanent change. So she decided not to return to teaching or to the sisterhood. She sought dispensation from her vows and moved to Boston, where she lived on her own for the first time in her life. In Boston, she continued to work and lecture and take private commissions. She created a gigantic mural for the Boston Natural Gas Company, which at the time was the largest copyrighted mural in existence. And she was commissioned by the US Postal Service to create the love stamp in 1985. Sadly, Carita died after a battle with cancer in 1968. Now, her legacy is complex. When I was considering the reasons for her being included in this poster project, I really was struck by how different her story is from many here. In many of the stories here, people and groups have physically taken to the streets to demand justice, sometimes violently. But Carita's contribution to that effort is audibly quieter, but visually and intellectually bold. She was a person who made statements about injustice in an environment that wasn't supportive of those statements, and she did so with joy and vibrancy. I think her impact is best described by writer and minister Rhonda Miska, who was deeply moved by Carita's artwork during a visit to the Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh, which I also happened to see, and it was really powerful. She wrote, People who can truly dwell in both the identity of the committed activist with eyes wide open to injustice and suffering and the identity of the joyful reveler in the goodness of the world are rare and precious. And that's something to celebrate. So thanks for joining me today. I hope that you'll join us next week on Live from the Gallery.